Hey, thanks for clicking in. We are so glad you chose to watch this video today. Around here, we have new videos uploaded each and every single week. So be sure to hit the subscribe button for your weekly dose of encouragement. As you watch this message, you may feel led to get connected to our ministry. Check out our YouTube description to find out how you can do just that. As you're watching, you may also feel led to sow into our ministry. Feel free to use any of the methods you see on your screen to give today. In this season, your giving is going towards all of the many outreaches we have going on throughout the month. I hope that this message blesses you. I know it's going to be awesome. So let's check it out. How many in here, if you could be honest, and maybe you're sitting with them, so just keep looking at me and they won't know <laughs> that it's them, but how many know somebody that knows it all? I mean, they have something to say about, yeah, I see hands going up, about everything. I mean, it could be open heart surgery. And they're going to talk about this and talk about that and talk about their friend Cleophas or Cleo, you know, and, and, and Ronald told me, you know, about that. And when you have that, this is what you should do. And it could be car engines and they've never worked on a car, but they have something to say about it. It could be cooking and they've only ever used a microwave, you know, they, they have something to say about everything. You could be talking about kids and they're going to give advice about kids even though they don't have no kids themselves. And it could be about marriage and they're on their third one, getting ready to probably be on a fourth one in a few years. And they got so much advice to give because they, they know it all. And the problem, you know, with people that, that know it all is not only are they horrible people to have conversations with, but whenever you know it all, you limit your growth. Because when people tend to think they know it all, they're always processing what they're going to say next and not listening to what a person is saying now. And when you do this, you rob yourself of the gift of just learning, of just asking questions. And, and maybe you've never done an open heart surgery, but if you're talking to a doctor that's done 30 of them or 100 of them, it's a good opportunity to ask some questions about how you could keep yourself from getting one. Or a car engine, like when should I take it to the shop? I have this light that's been on for like two years now. Is that bad or good? You know, rather than always bringing something to the equation, I've learned it's better to be a student than a poor teacher. And so every time God takes you into a new room, a new level, you got to understand you're always a student again. I can't tell you how many rooms I've been in where I'm honestly the, the stupidest person in the room. And that's not insulting me, but I've learned that if you put yourself in rooms where you're always the stupidest, then in the rooms that you control, you'll tend to always be the smartest. But if you always have this mentality that says, I know it all, then you never go after the wisdom that God wants you to have. The Bible says in James chapter one, verse five, that if anybody lacks wisdom, let them ask of God. God loves when we say, Lord, I don't know it all. I don't know it all. I'm trying to figure it out, but I really don't know it all. I don't know much about raising kids. I don't know much about marriage. I don't know much about, you know, working a good job, having a leadership position. Lord, I really don't know what I'm doing. It takes a lot of humility to say, I don't know what I'm doing. I remember when my mom had me, she was so protective of me. She would yell at people, you know, if they handled me wrong, you know, she, I would hear stories from my godmother and my grandparents, how your mom wouldn't let nobody hold you. She would protect your neck. She didn't want anybody holding you a certain way. If they touched your head too long, she'd yell at them because she didn't want it to get deformed or something because it was, you know, sensitive. And my mom was so, by the time she had her fourth child, my sister Bethany, she was throwing Bethany across the room to people. Why? Because 
when you have something and you don't really know it, know it all, you're really careful to not mess it up. But the longer you have it, the more wise you get. And you realize what I worried about there really wasn't worth my time. It really wasn't that big of a deal. You've gained wisdom through the years. And you realize everything's going to be okay. But you didn't have that in the beginning. And truthfully, if you had that in the beginning, you probably would have been too reckless in the beginning. Wisdom is given in the journey. With life and when it comes to the things of God, wisdom with God is given through the journey. When I got ordained, I got saved at 19. I didn't have a church background. I, I was a middleweight boxer. You know, I was a drug dealer in Brooklyn Homes. I mean, I, I did it all. I always tell the story. And most of my staff that's close to me has met him. But one of my father figures was little Melvin Williams. He, we would sit on his front porch, my team, and he would just tell them stories about me as a kid. His family's the one that gave me all my drugs when I started selling them. I was raised by my boxing trainer in, in Gilmore Homes. I, I, I fought on Fulton Avenue at Umar Boxing most of my childhood from about 9 to 21 years old. And I didn't have this church background, but I was raised by brothers in the nation of Islam. All my boxing trainers and my father figures were devout Muslims. So they taught me discipline. They taught me the Quran. Two times a year, we would go to the mosque on North Avenue and Hilton Avenue, and we would put on boxing shows at the national, you know, Muslim conventions or Islamic conventions. I had discipline. And I had a lot of ideas. But I'll never forget when I got saved, and I was saved at 19. I was an ordained minister by the age of 21. That's crazy. I didn't know what I was doing. And truthfully, if I could be honest, my pastor ordained me way too early. <laughs> but they were desperate for a youth pastor. And, you know, I, I, I was youthful. <laughs> and so they put me in this position and I put myself through Bible college and got my bachelor's degree in theology while I was working my way through a five-year union apprenticeship as an electrician, which I completed and then quit about six months after to be a full-time pastor in the church I started. But I didn't know much when I got started. And so I'll never forget Pastor Sharp sitting down with me and saying, you know, the best way to grow in this world is to come in here and forget everything you've been told about God in church and just be a sponge. And that's been my mentality all the way to this day. Every room I go into, I'm just a sponge. I want to ask a question. And nobody's story bores me. Some of the most exciting stories, if I'm honest, are when I talk to single moms or, or guys that get off the street or get out of prison. I prefer those stories sometimes over stories from billionaires and millionaires and preachers. There's never a boring story to me because everybody in here has their own story. That's what makes God so big is everybody in here has a different view of God. And your view of God helps me see God more clearly. Because if I only bring my view of God to the table, my view is so small. But when everybody brings their view of God to the table... Our God becomes so big. And that's what the church and the body of Christ is supposed to be. We come together to make God big. But he told me this. And I'm glad he told me this because it allowed me to just be excited to be in the presence of God. And I got that in my foundation. I never got caught up in church garbage and gossip and where's this going and where's that going. All I knew was like the blind man Jesus healed. I didn't care about all the politics. All I knew is I once was blind and now I see. <laughs> That's the only thing that mattered to me. People would say, have you heard? I don't want to know nothing. I don't care. 
What you're saying doesn't align with my experiences. So take your experiences to the dumpster. And don't try to pollute my innocence because you may not be happy. But I'm still excited and happy. And I've always had this mentality to just learn about God. And not have to, not have to know it all. Look at somebody and say, don't get it twisted. See, the problem is, is when you start knowing it all, people that tend to know it all want to be heard. And one of my favorite scriptures is found in 2 Thessalonians. All this is going to make sense by the time we get to Luke 24. He says, for we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. <laughs> They're not doing the work, but they got a lot to say. That's what he's saying. And when I read Peter, it really threw me off because look at the category that Peter puts people that just talk like they know it all in. He says, if any one of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other people's matters, he puts being a busybody in the same category as murders, murderers, thieves, and evildoers. Why? Because... When you think you know it all, you tend to say things that you shouldn't say. And the reason God cares so much is because words have power. And when you speak, life and death is in the power of the tongue. When you speak, something has to come to life. Yeah. And when you let people speak to you, something has to manifest in your life. Because words have power. James said the tongue has deadly poison. He also says we put bits in the horse's mouth so that we can control them and take them in any direction we want. He says the, 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 the tongue is like the rudder on the boat. It can take the boat deeper into the waters or get the boat out of the waters. And he, he wants us to know that your tongue is so powerful that it controls your whole body. People that don't live right don't talk right. Because this controls the body. And he says this can take you deeper into a storm or get you out of the storm. Because it has power. And so the reason that God cares so much about what comes out of our mouths is because our lives are a reflection of what we say. And if the average woman says 6,000 words a day, which is around accurate, <laughs> and the average guy says around 2,500 a day, that's why, fellas, you will never beat a lady in an argument. How many of those words are changing our life? How many of those words are keeping us in our normal? How many of those words are getting us deeper yeah. into the storm compared to the amount of words that come out of our mouths that bring life and resurrection? Pastor Sharps taught this message years ago. It, it was in Ezekiel chapter 30, and the message was called, If the Walls Could Talk. I remember it like it was yesterday. And Ezekiel is having a conversation with God, and this is what he says. Son of man, the children of thy people are still talking against you by the walls and in the doors of the houses. Speak one to another, every one to his brother, saying, come, I pray, let's hear what the word that comes from the Lord is. They come unto you as people come, and they sit before you as my people. They hear your words, but they won't do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goes after covetousness. Lo, thou art to them a lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear your words, but they don't do them. When this comes to pass, lo, it will. They will know a prophet's been among them. And what Ezekiel is trying to tell us is that whether it's in church or at home, God hears what comes out of our mouths. So much so that Jesus says on the day of judgment in Matthew 12, 36, we will be judged by every idle word we speak. 
Every word that did not have to come out of our mouth is being put on the scale right now. And what God is going to see on Judgment Day is, do the idle words outweigh the resurrection words? Because what we say matters. And the higher you go with God, you realize you cannot be loose with your words because words impact things. There are family members, and some are experiencing it right here, right now. There are family members that have not talked in years because of things that were said. Which to me is the stupidest reason not to talk because people say things in the moment to get reactions. And they may not have even really meant it. And to take a moment and destroy a lifetime of miseries is foolish to me. And there may be somebody, and I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but somebody that God is saying, just let them win. Let them win. Let them win. Yeah, they were wrong. Let them win. Tell them you're sorry. Tell them maybe you misunderstood it. Let them win. Because it's not worth losing your brother for the next 20 years. It's not worth losing your sister for the next 30 years. It's not worth standing over the casket screaming and weeping. You know why people do that at funerals? The people who have a lot of memories with a person, they tend to just sit there with teary eyes. The people that are screaming at the casket are all the people that wish they would have said something else. The one that just sits there with the lip quivering, keeping it together for the family, they said it all. They took them to the hospital visits. They texted, I love you every day. They don't have nothing to scream about. They live their life. They've made memories and made moments that will be cherished forever. And so you have to make a decision. Do I want to live with regrets one day? Or make as many memories and moments as I can right now. Because it's never worth winning the battle if you lose the war. So words mean so much. And whenever God hears conversation, he gets nosy. He steps in. He'll step into the bedroom. He's with you and your friends in your classroom. He's reading, and he's not just listening to conversation. He's reading every text message that goes out. He's God. He pays attention, and you want him to pay attention, because if he doesn't pay attention all the time, then he won't pay attention any of the time. And I want God to pay attention because I don't know if one day I may get cancer. I don't know if one day, you know, my my bones may start to break down on me. I don't know if one day I'm going to start losing my memory. I don't know if one day I'm going to need him to honor my prayers for somebody that I'm praying. So I've just learned to be good with God. But he especially draws close when his name is mentioned. The Bible says we're two or three gathered together in my name. I'm in the midst. Whenever he hears Jesus, he shows up. That's why the devil gets so uncomfortable when somebody steps back from a problem and just says, Jesus, you don't even need to know what to say. You don't need to know how to pray because God knows what you need before you even ask. Sometimes when my back's against the wall, I don't know what to say. I just say, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And it may not change my situation right away, but you know what it changes? It changes me right away. And I've learned that if I can change me on the inside, God will change what I'm experiencing on the outside. I dare somebody just to try it today. Say, Jesus, say, Jesus. Say Jesus. Now think about the sickness. Say Jesus. Now think about the argument. Say Jesus. Now think about the death and say Jesus. Now think about the cancer and say Jesus. Now think about your kids and say Jesus. Now think about the money and say Jesus. 
Don't you feel something shifting? The enemy does not stay in the vicinity when Jesus' name is mentioned. Say it again, Jesus! Whenever he hears his name, he shows up. And if I was the devil, it says we're two or three gathered together in my name. If I was the devil, I would do whatever it takes to keep godly people from connecting. Because if he gathers where two or three are gathered together in his name, I can win the battle if I just bring division. And this is what happened when Jesus was crucified. It, it, it brought division. Everybody was panicking. Everybody was scared. And I understand to some extent. It's hard to follow somebody whose name is seen in a negative light. To follow Jesus means you could be killed. To follow Jesus means your business could be shut down. To follow Jesus means you could lose your livelihood. To follow Jesus it's not looking too good. And ultimately, there's a lot of people that are just sad and discouraged because they gave three and a half years to following this guy, listening to him preach, watching the healing crusades, and watching the deliverances take place and watching the demons cast out and watching the storm stand still. They watched him. They looked up to him. He was their hero. It was Jesus. To walk with Jesus? It was something. Because immediately when Jesus came in to a city, the whole city turned. Everybody started following and showing up at seashores just to see this, this Nazarene man get off a boat. They would follow just to hear him talk from a distance on the boat. Girls with issues of blood knew that if I could just touch his garment, I could be made whole. When Jesus was coming through, the whole city turned upside down. So they gave up businesses to follow Jesus. They gave up memories with their families to follow Jesus. Peter had a wife. It says Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. But you never see Peter's wife's name or her mentioned ever again in the Bible. Because to follow Jesus sometimes means there's sacrifices that have to be made. James and John gave up following and taking over their father's fishing company. I mean, they were all giving up. Matthew gave up his accounting firm. They all just wanted to be a part of what Jesus was building. And so when he was snatched and when he was crucified and when he was hung up high and stretched out wide, their whole future shattered. Have you ever had a moment where your whole future shattered? Maybe it was through the loss of somebody. Maybe it was through the breakup with somebody. The job that went wrong. But to have your whole future shattered is traumatizing. And so the disciples, the core group, 11 minus Judas who has hung himself, they are hiding in a room. The women had the courage to go to the tomb in the morning. They didn't care what nobody thought. They were going to take care of Jesus, even if he was dead. And I expect for Jesus, when he resurrects, to go to Jerusalem. I expect for him to go into the upper room and meet his boys, the church leaders. He has 40 days to do a whole lot of stuff because you got to understand it wasn't enough 
just for Jesus to show himself to his team. Cult leaders do this all the time with their followers. They, they get their core teams to speak these crazy things that they witnessed. That's what makes people believe. But it's also what makes it temporary. Because the people following start to see that the hype is not really all that hype, you know, that much hypeful. So what did Jesus, he had to show himself, the Bible says, to over 500 people. Because he needed a crowd to see that this was real. So that 2,000 years later, it would still live on. He needed people all over Jerusalem to say, we saw them. Not just the team. We saw him. We saw him. So for 40 days, he was just showing himself to people, popping up here and popping up there. And John, you know, tells us uh, that Jesus did so many miracles in those 40 days that if there was a book to be written, it could not contain them. So he has a lot to do with a little bit of time. And before he even gets to his boys, he does the strangest thing. He finds two guys, who well, actually a guy and a woman. They believe it's Cleophas and, and his wife Mary who served around Jesus' mother. He finds these two disciples heading in the wrong direction and decides to take a walk with them. They are going down this road called the Emmaus Road. It's seven miles long. Seven is the number of completion. We'll get back to that. But he's, he's just following them down the Emmaus Road because his name was mentioned. And I said to myself, God, with all that you have to do, why are you choosing to go get these two disciples over going to the room where your boys are? And then it dawned on me that perhaps, 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 God was trying to let us know on Resurrection Sunday that I am more concerned about people going in the wrong direction than I am about the people that know me. That maybe, maybe he's trying to let us know that I am more caught up with people who are going down the wrong direction and experiencing a bad journey than I am trying to save church folks over and over. He starts walking with these two and, and it, it says that they're talking together, together about what happened. They're talking together about what happened, what happened, the past. Not what's going to happen, but what happened, what happened. And this is where you know a relationship is getting into a bad place. Whether it's friends or marriage, you name it. Is when the only thing that draws you together is what happened. I've done a lot of premarital and marriage counseling. And one of the things that I know is a big red flag is whenever negativity is the only thing a couple talks about. They're not talking about the vacations that they want to get to, to Italy, when they're going to retire, when the nest is going to be empty. You know, they're not talking about where we're going to live and taking Sunday drives into neighborhoods that are way beyond them. Because the moment you stop exposing yourself to better is the moment you stop getting better. The only thing that draws them together is, did you hear what they said? Driving home from family dinner. Did you see what she said and what she had on? It's toxicity. There's nothing good being talked about. It's always what happened. When's the last time you talked about what's going to happen and not what happened? It's been 10 years and you're still talking about what happened. Your therapist is loving it because it was 30 years ago and you're still talking about what happened. How long are you going to allow the devil to keep you in what happened to you? 
They're talking about what happened. They're talking about the Garden of Gethsemane. They're, they're talking about Jesus being snatched. They're talking about Judas' kiss. They're talking about the Last Supper. They're, they're talking about fond memories and sad memories. And they're, they're talking about all they gave up to follow Jesus. They're, they're talking about what happened. And it says that as they're talking about what happened, something happens. It says in verse 17, or verse 15, I apologize, and it came to pass. It came to pass. See, anytime you talk about Jesus, something has to happen. Whether positive or negative, something has to happen. It came to pass that while they're talking about Jesus, Jesus drew near and went with them. They're supposed to be in Jerusalem with the boys. They're not in Jerusalem. They're going in the wrong direction. These are the, how I, this is how I love how the Bible parallels itself. Because there's an Old Testament story about a guy who went in the wrong direction too. His name is Jonah. And God told him to go to, to Nineveh which was 500 miles from Jaffa where he was talking to God. And he decides to go to Tarshish, which is 2,500 miles away from where God talked to him. And he got on a boat and he paid the fare because anytime you go in the opposite direction of God, it's going to be expensive. Yeah, it's going to be expensive because whatever God is in, he picks up the tab for. Whatever God's not in, you got to take care of. That's why I serve. That's why I tithe. I make it clear to God, I want you in everything. I don't want responsibility for these bills. I don't want responsibility for my health care. I don't want responsibility for my retirement. I'm going to be a steward over what you gave me, but I want you included in everything that I, I have because I realize that when God's in it, something has to happen. Jesus, like the whale that came to swallow up Jonah is that whale tracking them down, trying to keep them from destroying the rest of their lives. That's why you're here today, especially if you don't have a relationship with God. You are here because God is trying to track you down so that you don't destroy the life you have left. So he drew near. Jesus is with him. And he went with him in the wrong direction. But their eyes were blinded or holden so that they could not see him. He was with them, but they could not see him. They're talking about everything that happened because they know it all. And he's walking with them, but they can't see it. Sad, and they can't see him. Talking negatively, and they can't see him. The tragedy of this text is that the one they were crying about was in their vicinity. All through the scripture, what people needed was within their reach. Wow. Whether it was the lady and the oil and the prophet said, how much oil do you have? Oh, I don't have a lot of oil. Or the lady with the little bit of meal that was getting ready to, 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 to eat their last meal, her and her son and die. Or, or the disciples when they said, we don't have enough bread and there was a little boy with a lunch and they overlooked him because the Bible says it was 5,000 men, not including women and children. So, you know, because in biblical days, they didn't really count the women and the children in the censuses. But isn't it like God to put the blessing in the hand of somebody who's not in the number? The boy was not in the number, but he was the one with with the miracle, the one with the miracle was overlooked. I'm infamous for this. I can lose something and it could be right in front of me 
and I'll be freaking out, whether it's a remote, you know, or my car keys, and I'm freaking out and asking, who, who saw this? Where did this go? And it's not that it's not there, it's, it's just hidden from me. And could you be in a bad season feeling like you're not experiencing God, not because he's not with you, but because he's hidden from you? And God doesn't just hide himself. Sometimes he will hide your blessing. Ask Joseph's brothers what it's like to go and stand in front of your brother and you can't even recognize him. I wonder how many people have a blessing in this season that is hidden. And because you know it all, God is not opening your eyes to your ram in the bush, Abraham. Their eyes were holding. Jesus is with them. And this is the tragedy of the text. My preaching people are going to love this one. This is the tragedy of the text. They know all about Jesus. They're talking about, you know, did you hear what happened to Jesus on Friday night? Mm, I, I know, I know my mom told me I shouldn't have followed him. He, he was kind of suspect. One of these days, somebody was going to get him. And they knew all about Jesus. They knew all about the women going down to the tomb. They, they knew all about him, supposedly, as they called him, being a mighty prophet and word and deed and, and feared by people and God loved. They knew all the stuff about Jesus. And this is what I find about people that know it all. They know all about church and the Bible, but they are so stupid when it comes to recognizing God's presence. How do you know so much about the story, but you can't recognize the Jesus in the story you're telling? They're so deep, they're actually drowning. Jesus hid himself. And just started walking with them. And this lets me know to all the people that try to make Jesus creepy. Because there are all those Christians that try to make Jesus creepy. In aisle seven speaking in tongues. You know, looking at bread. Saying all the names of the bread in tongues. To all the people that try to make Jesus creepy. This text lets me know that Jesus was just a down dude. How many of you are going to be walking with your spouse or with a friend and just let a stranger come in and start walking with you? And they don't know he's Jesus. They just like him. And he starts just walking with them. And they don't know who he is, but he just starts walking. And he starts asking questions. What y'all talking about? What y'all talking about? Why y'all walking in sad? You know? Like... He didn't know what just happened. But this lets me know that my emotions and what come out of my mouth go hand in hand. Yeah. Why are y'all talking like this? Walking like this? Crying like this? And one whose name was Cleophas said, this is so how we treat God sometimes. Are you a stranger? Are you the only one in Jerusalem that does not know the things which just happened? Isn't it possible that sometimes we treat God like he's a stranger? Like he don't know what's going on with us? Like he don't know that you're lonely? Like he don't know that you cry yourself to sleep? Like he don't know that you have panic attacks? Like he don't know that you struggle with depression? Like he don't know know that you're frustrated like he don't know that you're addicted like he don't know that you're having crazy thoughts these days sometimes if we're not careful we talk to God like he's a stranger and whenever you treat God like he's a stranger it is demonstrated by your walk your talk and your emotions we would never say God you're a stranger you don't get it but it is clear by how we talk, by how we walk, by what we say, 
by our emotions? Are you the only one that don't know what happened? And Jesus said, tell me about it. Like a therapist, what things? And they said, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, he was a prophet. Oh, now we get a clue. They followed Jesus for years. <clears throat> they were at the foot of the cross, Cleophas was, and his wife, at the foot of the cross. But the reason you're so hurt is because you don't see Jesus clearly. You don't see God. You see a prophet. I love getting into conversations with some of my friends and my trainers who are still a part of the Nation of Islam. And, you know, and I, I'll throw little things at them like, you know, well, it's kind of hard for me to trust in a God that's still buried in Mecca. How can he raise you from the grave if he couldn't even raise himself from the grave? <laughs> Just things that make you say, hmm. But I would get into it and, and, and I would talk to them because they believe that Jesus was a prophet. They don't debate Jesus' existence. That would be stupid. Jewish people don't debate Jesus' existence. There's too much history. There's too many writings, not just from Christians, but Roman atheists wrote about Jesus and his crucifixion and why he was crucified. Josephus, a Jewish historian who did not believe in the Jesus movement, documented. And it said that he fed 5,000 people. It said that he rose people from the dead. All of this stuff was written by people who did did not root for Jesus. There's too much evidence. There's too much history. They all believe one thing, that he was a prophet. And if you don't see God clearly for who he is, you're not going to see God clearly in your life. He's not going to let you see him in an intimate way. If you can't even see him in the way the Bible is trying to tell you to see him. Amen. They see him as a prophet. And we all say, I, I believe he's the son of God. But do our actions say that we really believe he's the son of God? He was a mighty prophet indeed. He did good things. And he was a good preacher. That boy could preach before all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death. And they have crucified him. And here it goes. But we trust it. Oh, now the heart's leaking. We trust it. That's what it comes down to. We trust it. We trust it. This is what makes a brand have power. All a brand that has power is, is something that you can trust in. They have shown consistency. That's why the worst thing a person can do is do something off brand. Because every day you get out of bed, you're being interviewed. Fair or not, you are. You go to a job, you're getting interviewed. Your kids are interviewing you. Your spouse is interviewing you. Family events, you've been going to church lately. They're interviewing you. Everybody is watching you to see, do you have a new brand? Are you brand new? Or are you just the same you? A brand is something you can trust in. And so whenever somebody sends a mixed signal out, it weakens their brand instantly. And they're saying, we trust it. We no longer trust Jesus. We no longer trust church. And when trust is gone, whatever you're still hanging on to is only on life support. Henry Cloud, a person I deeply respect, and I got, I got to have a cool dinner with him a few months ago, and we talked about his book that's been speaking to me a lot over the last year called Trust. 
He wrote a whole book on trust. And the danger with losing trust is whenever there's no trust, everything gets harder. Because trust is what makes everything move forward. Trust is what brings momentum. And they're saying, we trusted in him. We trusted in what he sold us. And they're heartbroken. They have gone on this seven mile journey because they were heartbroken. This seven mile journey in the wrong direction, away from God, not because they're bad people, but because they trusted. Every person in here that has ever had your trust violated can understand how one moment of broken trust can send you on a bad journey. Whether it was as a child, somebody you trusted, or whether it was your marriage, somebody you trusted, a parent figure, somebody you trusted, most people end up on a bad journey because of trust gone wrong. We trusted that he would be the one that redeemed Israel. And besides all of this, to, today is the third day since these things were done. He told us for three and a half years on the third day he would rise and the women went down to the tomb and he was not there. The boys went down to the tomb and he was not there. It is the, the, the third day he lied. We waited around till today to start walking because he told us on the third day. And lo and behold, God didn't lie. It's just that they're walking with him on the third day. And they are so convinced of their facts that they can't even recognize the Jesus that's keeping a promise to them. And right when they get done telling him about the women going down to the tomb, Jesus just freaks out and says, basically, okay, don't get it twisted. Oh, Fools. He, he's talking to Cleophas or Cleo and he's saying, dude, how foolish do you got to be? And the reason you're looking and talking like a fool right now is because your heart is not slow to quit. You're showing me that by walking down this road. You're quick to quit. You're, you're quick to throw in the towel but you're not quick when it comes to your belief system. It is possible for us to be quick in all the negative things, but slow when it comes to trusting and believing in God. I love the story they were sharing the offering because I, I know the young boy and the, I heard the story too that he was so excited to give his offering. And the reason that's so big to me and the reason that's so important is because it shows me a mother and a father that are teaching their children legacy. Abraham and Isaac were walking up the mountain. Isaac looks at his father and says, I see the wood, I see the knife, but where's the sacrifice? He wasn't questioning his father because he, he thought he was going to be the one. I've heard it preached like that. He was questioning his father because his father trained him that you never go in the presence of God without a sacrifice. Are our children trained so well that if they didn't see you pick up an envelope, they would challenge you on the way home? That's legacy. Because if it's not passed down, they're going to have to experience all the stuff you experienced until you learned how to be grateful for God. You're so slow to believe. To believe. Either all of that book works for you 
or none of it works. You cannot pick and choose. Because if you pick and choose, none of it works for you. He says, you're slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. And I love this. All Christ not to have suffered to enter his glory. What you don't get is you don't get glory without suffering. You cannot have a crown without a cross. You thought those blessings were going to come easy. You thought a kingdom was going to be given to you. You cannot have a crown without a cross. And there are some that have been on a journey and know what it's like to carry a cross. And maybe you're carrying your cross right now. But God wants you to know the cross is only the prerequisite to your glory. These present suffering Sufferings cannot be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed in us. There is some glory coming into your life. You would not be going through so much hell if there wasn't going to be so much glory. You wouldn't be so under attack if there wasn't going to be so much glory. The kids wouldn't have such, if they didn't have such a great destiny, they wouldn't be under attack. But because there's going to be so much glory, he says, don't you under understand what the book says you cannot have glory without suffering and so starting at Moses and the prophets he expounded to them the scriptures in seven miles he took them from Genesis to Malachi seven miles about two hours maybe two and a half hours just walking down the dusty road towards Emmaus with the wind blowing and the dust in the air. He gives them a tabernacle teaching. He gives them an Exodus teaching. He gives them an Isaiah teaching. He's taking them all through the book. And this is amazing to me because you can go to school like I did for four years and get a bachelor's and still not learn the whole Bible. And God is giving them an advanced education in two and a half hours. Don't tell me that if you get serious for God, he can't qualify you for something bigger than you. He, he gave them a doctorate discourse in two and a half hours on the road to Emmaus. And it says that he, he got them through the journey. They didn't know it was him. If I was them, I would have said, who are you that you know so much about him? But I can tell you this, they are soaking it up. They do not interrupt him. They are listening. And it says that he would have left and they begged him to come home with them. They begged him. He would have left after the seven miles. See, I've learned in life, God will get you to the end of the journey, but what happens next is up to you. He'll make sure that nothing crazy happens in your journey. But what happens next is up to you. Only you can be the one to say, Jesus, I want you to come home with me. I want you to come to my dinner table. I want you to hang with my family. And Jesus, remember, he has a lot to do in 40 days. He goes with them. And they sit down because Cleophas and his wife, they've been with Jesus for a while. They've seen the feeding of the 5,000. They heard the sermon where he related the bread to his body and the flesh to his blood. And all these disciples left because that sermon freaked them out, it says in John 6, 66. They heard all the stories. They, they were there. They were there at the Last Supper. They were there. The Last Supper was not just the 12. It was a room full of people. There were women and everything in that room. They were there. 
And they invite Jesus in. And now they're the host. Imagine you inviting me to your house and I just go in your fridge and start cooking. <laughs> it says that when Jesus went into the house, he started serving them. He sat at meat with them. He took the bread. He blessed it. He broke and he gave to them. He took it. Look at how when you bring God into your life, he takes over. He took over. The minute you say, Jesus, come with me, he takes over. He takes over. He doesn't ask for permission. He just takes over. Your house now becomes his house. He just takes. Your marriage now becomes his marriage. He just takes. Your kids now become his kids. He just takes over. Your accounts become his accounts. He just takes over. And it says that Jesus came in and he, he took over. Has God taken over everything tied to you? He just took over and he, he's serving them communion. He, he takes the bread and he, 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 he put it in his hands. He broke it, gave to them. He took it in his hands. He broke it. He gave them. I've taught this through the years, like the feeding of the 5,000. He took it in his hands. He blessed it. He broke it. He passed it. And this is the process every person in this room will go through. Number one, you have to be grateful for the fact that you're in God's hands. All that matters in life is that I'm in God's hands. I, I could be in his hands and have cancer. I'll be okay. I could be in his hands and have a disease. I'll be okay. I could be in his hands and depressed. I'll be okay. I could be in his hands and be broken. I'll be okay. I'll, I could be in his hands and not have enough money. I'll be okay. I would rather be in his hands than out of his hands with everything looking like it's right. Lord, put me in your hands because I I know that if I'm in your hands, you won't drop me. He put it in his hands. He, 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 he blessed it. He broke it. Why does he bless before the breaking? Well, he wants us to know that when the breaking seasons of life come, understand this. You were blessed before they happened. So you will be blessed when you come out of it. Say, I'm blessed. You are not going through the brokenness to be blessed. You were blessed before it ever started. And if I was blessed going in, I got to be blessed coming out. But why does he break me after he blesses me? Well, it's because he's breaking you. And he doesn't break multiple pieces of bread. He just takes one loaf and he breaks it. He breaks it. One piece of bread. He breaks once. And now it's two halves, but together it's one whole. Two pieces of bread that he's trying to distribute. Could Cleophas and his wife be two pieces of bread that God wants to distribute? He only breaks you because he wants to pass you. And the more he breaks you, the more qualified you are to reach greater amounts of people. Amen. I've never seen somebody truly used that has not also been severely broken. Every person I know that God has used has been broken. Broken in ways that they cannot truly ever be put back together. Thorns that they will carry to the grave one day. But that's the price tag of greatness. Because what good is it to be a doctor that doesn't even know what medicine feels or tastes like? Mm, that's good. Yeah. So he breaks you to pass you. And it says that when he did this, their eyes were opened and he was out. He only stayed with them to get their eyes open. He only stayed with this couple 
just to get their eyes open. What was it about the breaking of the bread and the distribution that made him, them say, it's Jesus. They couldn't recognize him on the journey. What was it about this that made them say, it's Jesus? He broke it, which was what he went through. He was broken by his father. He was blessed, passed to the world 2,000 years later. We're here because Jesus was passed. But when he served them the bread, they saw something Thomas didn't even get to see it. They saw his wounds. There's something about a servant's wounds that win people. I used to think it was my strength that brought people to Jesus. But as I've gotten older, I realize my most valuable tool to win people for Christ is not my strengths. It is my holes. It is my wounds. When they saw the wounds, they knew it was Jesus. Why didn't he do this at the beginning of the journey? Well, seven is the number of completion. And there's certain things that God does not do at mile one because there's still some things he needs you to understand about him. But being confident in this, he that has begun a good work in you will complete it. Now, I'm not going to lie. I've heard the Emmaus Road preached before. I've heard this preached through the years. And everybody focuses on the seven mile journey. But it dawned on me last week. It wasn't just a seven mile journey. Because they ran back to Jerusalem. So it wasn't a seven mile journey for them. It was a 14 mile journey for them. They had to go back, Jonah. They, they had to go back to the place. But this time around, see, seven is the number of completion. But 14, I've seen this number in the Bible before. Seven and 14, seven and 14, seven and 14. It was Jacob who worked seven years to, to, to get Leah, who he didn't really want. And, and he worked for seven years. It was a seven-year journey for nothing. But in the next seven years, he got Rachel. And Rachel changed his life. Seven is the number of completion. What's the number 14 represent? It represents deliverance. Yeah, and, and God doesn't just want to complete something in your life. He wants to pull you out of something in this season. He wants to pull you out of what you've been experiencing, what you've been going through. He wants to pull you out of all the pain and the anxiety. He wants to pull you out of the depression. He wants to pull you out of the turmoil. God is saying in this season, don't get it. Twist it. He did not walk with you on this journey for nothing. He walked with you on this journey because he knew that if he got somebody like you, the next seven years, you would be running. Let me make it plain. The first half of your life, that journey may have been hard. But the second half of your life, God says this is going to be the season where you run. You're going to run like you're a teenager. You're going to run like you're in your 20s. You're going to run like you're in your 30s. God is saying, I'm going to renew your strength. I'm going to give back the years that the canker worm and the locusts have eaten because this is going to be your finest season of your journey. It says that they ran back to Jerusalem. Where did they get the energy to run? Well, it says when he vanished. They said to him, themselves, did not our heart burn 
within us. While he expounded on the scriptures. I don't know what it is about me. But I'm still like the nerdy preacher that loves to dig and dig and dig until I see something fresh about God. I can't preach something that I'm not passionate about. I don't use notes because I am my notes. <laughs> I don't need my notes. My notes need me. If I was going to preach off a piece of paper and stand behind my podium the whole time, I might as well just after worship give you an outline and send you home. But I believe that if you're going to preach it, it has to be out of something that burns in you. And when it burns in you, you could talk about it for hours. I get long winded. It's almost noon and I can keep going. <laughs> to this day, the scriptures still make me burn. And when the scriptures are no longer good enough to make you burn, anything else that does is only temporary. They burned so much that they ran back to Jerusalem and they busted into the room where the disciples were. And they said, man, y'all better believe he is risen. The women weren't lying. And right as they were talking, because two or three where they gathered together in his name is in the midst. The disciples weren't on one accord. He could not show up until there was one accord in the room. Oh, how blessed it is when the brethren dwell together. On the day of, 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 the day of Pentecost, it says they were gathered together on one. God cannot show up in a place that is full of discord. So because he couldn't get his church boys in order, he went to the streets. He went to the dusty roads. Because he needed two people fired up. Where two or three gathered together in my name, I'm in the midst. I don't got 11 that are together. But if I go to the streets and walk along the journey with, with these two disciples, I know it won't be a wasted journey. They may miss out on a little bit over these seven miles, but when I finally get them, they're going to be so loud as a married couple that any room I'm not in, I will be in because they're there. And now I understand why Jesus walked the journey with them with so much to do. It was an investment. You always know when somebody's investing in you when they barely have enough time to do anything for themselves, but they're making time for you. It is an investment. But I just ask you to do one thing with your life. Never waste my time. Because I don't have a lot to give. Make it pay off. I understand how powerful an investment is. And God is saying, the reason I've been with you so long on your journey is because you are an investment. I bought you, not with money. You could buy cheap stuff with money. Anything you could buy with money is cheap. Even if it's a $10 million, it's cheap compared to the grand scheme. Jesus said, I have so much of an investment in you. I gave my life. That's how much you're worth to God. He not only did the journey with you from the time you were born forward, he paid for you with his life. And he's saying to somebody today, it's time for the bad part of the journey to be over. It's time for the running part of the journey to start. It's time for the burning 
part of the story to start. When's the last time you burned for God? And God is saying, I'm waiting for the second half of your journey to start. But you got to get to the place where when it comes to God, you don't know it all. But you're just a student ready to start all over. In closing, Jesus made this statement. He said, unless you come to me like a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And the thing I love about children is if I pulled the kids in here, they may be a little nervous. But if I had a couple of the boys come in here and get on stage right now, they're, they're so innocent. I could say jump and they would jump. I could say spin around and they'd spin around. They don't say but, 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 but. They, they just... They just do it. And God is saying, when's the last time when it came to your faith that that's been how you are? I just do it. I just do it. I remember when I first heard about tithing, I started tithing. My money was not right. I started tithing. Within six months of starting to tithe, my car got repossessed. I got it back. I didn't stop tithing. But the reason it got repossessed is because I put on my Nikes and I just did it. I jumped, I spun, my pastor said serve, I signed up that Sunday and started driving the church van around the city, I just jumped, I just spun. When's the last time you just jumped? When's the last time you just spun? And could that be the reason your life's not burning no more? Or if it is burning, you're like the two that brought strange fire into the tabernacle. It was a burn that God did not recognize. Because the only burn that God recognizes is the kind of burn that comes from living a life of following his book. So how bad do you want to burn? How bad do you want the second half of this journey to start, because God is saying, don't get it twisted. I've been with you all along, but this is the season where I want you to see me and see that I've been with you all along.